This video has something really exciting thanks to the fact that the last video on this topic struck a chord with you, the MMO population, amassing nearly a million views so far and even gaining the attention of Jagex, developers of RuneScape. Jagex then reached out to me and said, hey, we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have while making the next video. That was the kind of behind the scenes insight I could not refuse. So in this video, you aren't just getting my analysis on why these MMOs have managed to thrive where others struggle to survive, but you're also getting the developer's thoughts and insights as well. I asked Jagex easy questions like, why do they think old school RuneScape is thriving while other MMOs are dying? But I also asked them hard questions like, why do they think old school RuneScape is doing so much better than the game that created it, RuneScape itself? And perhaps the most interesting question I asked was about the bots, because every time I mention RuneScape in one of these videos, there's always a ton of people who say the entire population is bots. So I wanted Jagex to tell me what percent of their population was bots. Yeah, so bots and old school. Um... What I did didn't see coming was that they didn't dodge the question. They answered it head on and then proceeded to share never before revealed information about bots in RuneScape and the measures they're taking to combat them. So strap in, this video gets incredibly interesting. In this video, I'll go over why I think old school RuneScape is succeeding where others are failing, and I'll compare my answers to those that Jagex gave me. I was curious to see if we would arrive at the same conclusions or completely different ones, me, an avid MMO consumer, and them, the developer of one of the most successful MMOs of all time. Let's dive in, but first things first, why I made this video. You need to understand that it doesn't matter which MMO we look at, it's always the same graph, a general bleed of players over the past 5 to 10 years. This makes the incredibly rare MMOs that have defied this trend all the more impressive. Whether we're looking at World of Warcraft, BDO, EverQuest 2, Lord of the Rings Online, Elder Scrolls Online, SWOTOR, or even the sibling of old school RuneScape itself, RuneScape 3. The trend is always the same, they are always down over the last 10 years. This isn't to say those MMOs are by any means dead, but the fact that it's such a consistent and widespread problem does at the very least indicate that it's incredibly difficult to maintain, let alone grow, the population of your MMO over the better part of a decade. Which is why when two MMOs manage to buck this trend, I want to know why. What are these two MMOs doing right and what are the other MMOs doing wrong? The two major MMOs that presently escape this trend are Final Fantasy XIV and Old School Runes. Escape, two games that couldn't be more different, frankly, which actually helps in my opinion because we can look for what they have in common to pinpoint what they're doing right. Why is it that this MMORPG with its high fantasy, flashy cinematics and complex battle rotations and this MMORPG with its simple combat, old school progression and shall we say less than impressive graphics are the two MMOs bucking the trend? They are so incredibly different but what is it that they have in common that allows them to thrive where others have struggled to survive? But first, sponsor. Okay, so you probably heard about Hogwarts Legacy, the most anticipated release so far this year. This brand new Harry Potter game allows you to explore the school of Hogwarts and the surrounding areas like never before. Jump on your broom and find every secret hidden away in this beautiful world. But did you know about Kingwin? an online store that has tons of deals for gamers to buy all the games they want to buy? No? Well, let me tell you all about Kingwin, the sponsor of today's video. If you click the link in my description, you can easily browse the Kingwin store for deals on Hogwarts Legacy. But Hogwarts Legacy isn't the only game you can buy, of course. You can search for any game you want, like the incredibly popular Dead Space remake that recently came out. Just search for the Dead Space remake at the top of the screen, then choose from one of the many options that pops up and add it to your cart. Once here, you can enter my promo code for a discount. As you can see, Kingwin has very competitive offers for gamers just like you so that you can shop and save with ease. For peace of mind, it's worth noting that Kingwin also has a fantastic 24-7 support team to help you with any issues you might have with your purchase. Be sure to use the link down in the description below as well as my promo code which is on screen right now for the full discount. Thanks for listening and let's get back to the video. First, a brief history of old school RuneScape and how it came to be for those that don't know. RuneScape originally launched in 2001, the game would see extraordinary growth, seeing more popularity in its prime than nearly any other MMO that's existed in history except for World of Warcraft. But in 2012, after watching the game trend down for six years, the developers set out to make some big changes to RuneScape. Those were a tumultuous six years, where RuneScape had lost a lot of players and added a lot of microtransactions. The community felt like the game was losing what made it special, it was losing its simple combat, its simple monetization, its identity. It was turning into something that was less RuneScape and something more like every other MMO. So the community begged Jagex to create a version of RuneScape that was more like the RuneScape they fell in love with, to do something that no other games were really doing at the time. 
the players wanted Jagex to rewind time on the game. And to Jagex's credit, they found a version of the game from 2007, dusted it off, and polled the community on whether they wanted this version of the game to be released as its own game. The community voted yes, and this polling system was then used to decide on all major changes to Old School RuneScape moving forward. Old School RuneScape would launch in February 2013 based on a 2007 version of RuneScape, which coincidentally or not, was also near the peak of its popularity. And because all major changes to the game would be decided on by polls given to the player base, Old School RuneScape would quite literally be a game made for the community by the community. So that's how old school RuneScape came to exist. But what's it doing that is so different from the rest of the MMOs out there to cause it to consistently grow its player base every year since its creation in 2013? Well, a lot, actually. I mean, look at it. It is unabashedly old school. Some would call its graphics horribly outdated. Others would say they have a nostalgic charm and simplicity to them. And to be fair, both sides are right. It's an incredibly unique MMO experience, which is definitely one of the things it has going for it. If you look around at all the other MMORPGs, Geez, you won't find anything that looks or feels like old school RuneScape. There's something distinct and instantly recognizable about the art style. You know a RuneScape screenshot the second you see one. Other MMOs are running away from their past, old school RuneScape is running towards it, and this has paid off in spades. But in my opinion, the biggest thing old school RuneScape does different from all the struggling MMORPGs out there is monetization. Do you know how many microtransactions RuneScape has? None. Not a single one. You can't keep getting away with it! He can't keep getting away with it! In an era where more and more games are trying to go quote unquote free to play, in order to justify the addition of endless microtransactions, RuneScape is fine to simply have a sub. Now, the great thing about subscriptions is not that you have to pay them, but that you don't have to pay for anything else. By choosing this form of monetization, the developers are not incentivized to make their game objectively worse, simply to pressure you into buying a solution for a problem they created. That is the problem with microtransactions in MMORPGs. It's not not that the developers are trying to make some extra money, it's how. Their monetization efforts are so painfully short-sighted and uninspired. They always default to making the game worse so that they can sell you a way to make it better again. Why would any sane person expect any other outcome than a bleeding of players? Sometimes the developers intentionally make your inventory too small so that you have to buy a larger one. Sometimes they will artificially slow your progress behind time-gated currency to make you buy more. Sometimes they will intentionally make everything you find look lame or unattractive so that you are incentivized to buy a cosmetic to fix that problem. Worst of all, it's rarer and rarer that the developers are choosing only one of these systems to self-sabotage. Oftentimes, they are choosing all of them and more, leaving us, the player, to experience a game that is not only fundamentally flawed, but intentionally flawed. We are left with the option to buy all of these solutions or to try to play through them and endure the discomfort. This is doubly bad because these are all things in the game that could have and would have been positive, happy juice-inducing moments in an MMORPG. Not only are the developers adding a negative interaction, but they are also losing a very strong, positive interaction. The joys of earning a really cool cosmetic or finding a massive inventory upgrade are lost, and worse, they are replaced with that grimy feeling of pulling out your wallet to have access to a feature that was very clearly stripped out of the game so they could sell it to you. And guess what? The developers successfully make their game less fun as a result, and not surprisingly, players leave time and time again. The impact these microtransactions have on MMOs is consistent. Having a subscription isn't very unique. Lots Lots of MMOs try to have subscriptions and still bleed players. The game still has to be good, but it is so much easier for your game to be good when you're not intentionally looking for ways to make it bad so you can sell the solutions. Old School RuneScape does not sell cosmetics, instead you go out and earn the best cosmetics. They don't sell level skips, they pace the game appropriately to begin with. They don't sell pay to win, there's enough of that in real life and games are where we go to escape real life. In other words, the game is complete with nothing carved out of it for the sake of microtransactions. And I think this this is the key to old school RuneScape's success and its ability to not only retain players, but grow. But this is just my opinion as an avid gamer who consistently tries new MMOs only to quit when I get to the point where the microtransactions just become too much. When I hit that point where the things I would normally do have been replaced by a credit card swipe or my progression has slowed to a point where I can't proceed reasonably without opening the cash shop. I log off and I don't log back in again. And judging by the numbers, so do most of you. But what does a developer 
developer who has been playing and working on one of the most successful MMOs of all time, Think, after nearly 20 years of experience with the game. I chatted back and forth with Mod Sween and Mod Goblin in the Discord for a bit, and because our schedules couldn't line up, I sent them some questions to have them answer and record and send back to me. So that's what you're going to see here and my reaction to those. First things first, let's have Mod Sween introduce himself. Hey, how's it going? I'm Alec. Old school RuneScape players will know me as Mod Sween. Firstly, look, I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to talk to you and your viewers about old school RuneScape. A bit about myself. I first started playing RuneScape in 2004 when I was 11 years old. I first joined Jagex in 2015, uh, working in the customer services team, then eventually moving into community management for Old School RuneScape, and now I'm working in marketing for Old School RuneScape. With introductions out of the way, I got straight to the point and asked Alec. If you had to choose one thing and point to that as the reason for old school RuneScape success, what would it be? This is what he said. Choosing just one thing is so difficult. I don't want to. Uh, there's so many things I would like to say. Maybe I'll cheat a little bit later on, but for now, I think I'll just say how, how community-driven and player-driven we are as a dev team. We talk to players about every change we make. You can find us on every social media platform. We're on live stream at least once a week. There's in-game polling, which controls the, the, the flow of content coming in as well as the type of content coming in. Okay, so to sum that answer up, it sounds like he attributes the success of the game to the community, both the effort that the developers put into keeping in touch with the community and the content that the community creates for the game. It's a lot more of a campy answer than I was expecting, given that I went with monetization, but he brings up a great point. Another thing that Old School RuneScape does that no other MMOs do is pull the community on every major change or addition that is made to the game. I didn't peg this as the reason for the Old School RuneScape success over the years, but I definitely agree that it is part of it. I can't think of a single other game that's being developed this way. Literally every major change to the game has to be approved by the players themselves. Take, for instance, microtransactions. They are unlikely to be added because theoretically they would have to be voted for by the community. Can you imagine if the MMO you're playing had to ask you if they could add a microtransaction before they added it? Would you vote yes to having them sell you a solution to a problem they made? Or would you vote for them to fix the problem that they made instead of selling it to you? With that in mind, maybe pulling the community aspect is more of a reason for the game success than I first considered. So we'll circle around to that again later in this interview. But first, if you're enjoying this video, please be sure to like and subscribe for more MMO content like this. All right, now we're coming up on some of the toughest questions I asked Alec about old school RuneScape. These are the ones that companies typically would like to avoid answering, but Alec impressed me. It's been very interesting to compare old school RuneScape to other MMORPGs and look at how it compared to them. But now I was going to change the focus and pit old school RuneScape against its sibling RuneScape, because this is where I think the most interesting comparison of all lies. We've all been to a point in our lives where we get to a metaphorical fork in the road, maybe when we decided what we would major in school or what job we would apply to, and we have to choose one path in our life or another without ever knowing what would have happened if we chose the other one. All we can do is wonder. Jagex doesn't have to wonder. It hit that fork in the road and it chose both paths. We have old school RuneScape, which is what RuneScape would have been had it stuck to its roots and avoided microtransactions. And we have RuneScape 3, which is what happened when they tried to evolve RuneScape into a more modern MMO with many more microtransactions to keep up with the shifting MMO landscape. We have two versions of the same MMO existing in the same market at the same time, so it's quite easy to see which one made arguably the right choices. I knew very well that this would be a difficult question for Alec to answer because anything he says might be misinterpreted as a bash against RuneScape 3, but he did a really good job of navigating the answer and delivering one with substance. Okay, so what I'm going to say next might sound really simple, but bear with me, I, I think it makes sense. I think old school is just old school. There's nothing else like it. We're not trying to be like any other game. We are who we are. It's a unique game. It's quite a quirky game. There's no MTX. It's recognizable. It's easy to understand. It's really difficult to master. Now, RuneScape 3, it kind of carved a different path for itself, right? It made a shift more toward other MMOs with action bars and abilities and stuff. Now, I don't think that's a bad thing. It does what it does really well, and it's a thriving game in and itself. Last year was awesome for them. Uh, lots of new dungeons, lots of new quests, a couple of skill reworks, new training methods, new rewards, new equipment and all that. So I think as simple as it sounds, old school being old school is the, the key distinction for me. 
I completely agree with Alec here. I think one of the main reasons old school RuneScape does so well is because it's incredibly unique. You will not find another MMORPG like it. It's not ashamed of how old it is and how old its systems looks. It's proud of it. The players revel in that old school feel and anytime they want to experience that old school feel, they can come back and play old school RuneScape again. And there's another interesting observation to be made here. Not only have we witnessed old school RuneScape success from 2013 to now, but also one of the other most popular MMORPGs in the world right now, WoW Classic, which just had its Wrath of the Lich King expansion. Two of the top five MMOs in the world are currently held by classic versions of existing MMOs. Think about that for a second. Clearly, there is still an appetite for the way older MMORPGs handled things, whether it be their simplicity, their monetization, their rewards, or maybe all of these things. The demand is there. Old School RuneScape recognizes that and it's embracing it. Next, I asked him what he thought about the subscription model existing in an era where more and more games are trying to take the microtransaction route instead. Old School RuneScape is a sub to play MMORPG with what amounts to a small free trial. There is a limited amount of content that you can try without buying the subscription with either real money or in-game gold. As you can see here, the areas in red are the areas you would need to buy a bond, also known as a subscription to access. Here's what Alec had to say. It's quite a simple answer I've got, but I think it's just a perfect fit. A subscription model is just a perfect fit for old school RuneScape. In your last video, you, you said that old school RuneScape is a numbers go up game. I think there's a lot more to us than that, but I think you're also quite accurate. Uh, but with a game like that, it's really important to respect the time that players put in. And that's what a subscription model does, you know, versus an alternative type of model. I've seen players discuss our, you know, membership subscription approach and unanimously, they seem to come to the same conclusion that we do as well now in marketing i've got one simple goal really to just tell as many players about old school as possible we're a subscription based game so for me it's easy to try and get as many players as possible and that's how we'd be successful he touches on something important when the primary mode of funding your game is subscription based it forces the developer to make a good and complete game above all else the goal when your game's revenue is derived purely based on the number of people playing it and nothing else is to make sure the player is having fun and nothing else the goal when your game is monetized with microtransactions shifts from making sure the player wants to keep playing the game to making sure the player wants to spend money in the game the question of what they can do to keep you around starts to come after the question of what they can do to get your wallet out. When keeping you around stops being the priority, player retention plummets and the game's population dwindles. This is exacerbated by the fact that the average MMO's monetization team is incredibly unimaginative. Here's a challenge to the MMO monetization teams everywhere. Sell me something that I wasn't already able to earn in old MMOs. Sell me something that wasn't a memorable experience in old MMOs. I challenge you to come up with a transaction that doesn't cannibalize some piece of the game's content. If you're not coming up with transactions that don't cannibalize the content, you're actually bad for your MMO's long-term health. And this is why when you look at the top three MMO RPGs out there right now, every single one of them is subscription-based. That monetization method has so far been the only one that is able to incentivize developers to ask themselves what is best for every player in the long term, as opposed to asking themselves what is best for whales in the short term. Next up, I asked him to talk about bonds because I talked about the WoW token system from World of Warcraft in the last video with a bit of criticism. If if you don't know what the WoW token is or an old school RuneScape bond is, it's basically an in-game currency that you can use to pay your monthly sub. You can use in-game gold to buy a WoW token or an old school RuneScape bond, and then you can use that token or bond to pay the next month's sub, thereby playing your MMO for free. That part is great. The downside of the WoW token and the old school RuneScape bond is that on the flip side, players can buy these with real life cash and then sell them to other players for in-game gold. Effectively, it legitimizes the buying of in-game gold with real life money, which I'm never a fan of. So here's what Alec had to say about bonds in RuneScape. Uh, you also mentioned bonds, and I don't want to shy away from that because I think it's an important exception, the distinction that you mentioned. My personal opinion as a player and also, you know, working at Jagex and old school RuneScape, I think they complete subscription model. It gives an option for players who otherwise might not be able to subscribe using real money. Um, and once you're, you know, you've progressed your character a fair bit in game, you'll probably find that maintaining your subscription just in game without 
without spending anything in real life. It's actually quite easy. It doesn't take too much time. And the only other thing I wanted to say as well about uh, monetization and subscription stuff, Iron Man mode in both RuneScape and old school RuneScape, I think is probably the purest way of monetizing in any game or any, any MMO to be precise, right? You can't interact with other players. There's no trades. Uh, you're limited to what you can buy. You can't buy bonds. You can't buy anything else, that type of thing too. It's just about overcoming challenges by yourself. So Iron Man mode, subscription based completely. That's a really pure way of monetizing MMOs. I'm a big fan of what we do and how we how we do it, for sure. I personally probably won't ever be a fan of being able to exchange WoW tokens or bonds for gold in game just because I feel like that's a slippery slope straight to pay to win. But I'm totally on board with letting players convert their gold into a sub if developers want to go that route to allow more players to access their game. But the reality is old school RuneScape is a game that has zero microtransactions, not a single one. In RuneScape, even if you bought all that gold, you still have to go out and do every quest in the game to use and flex the quest cape. You still have to go out and kill some of the most difficult bosses in the game to get things like the Inferno Cape. Cosmetics in Old School RuneScape really mean something because every notable cosmetic is earned in game by playing the game rather than through a microtransaction. They are worn like badges of honor, just like in the old days of MMOs when you saw someone running around with a really cool weapon or a chess piece or a mount. You knew exactly what they had to accomplish to have that. And most importantly, it inspired you to want to go do the same thing. And that's what I miss most about old MMORPGs and the days before microtransactions when every cosmetic or mounts told a story and inspired you to go out and find your story. Alec also brought up a great point about the Iron Man system, allowing you to experience the purest form of the game, where you can't even sell bonds for gold. So if the bond system was a deal breaker for you, they have you covered. That's a really good point, and I'm glad that he mentioned it. Now I wanted to dive a little deeper into the impact of the polling system on old school RuneScape success because it's incredibly unique. If the community does not vote in favor of a change, the change does not happen. This is a fascinating way to decide on how to add content to an MMO, but of course it comes with its own set of challenges. For instance, what if the devs come up with an incredible idea and the community just doesn't see the vision? So I asked Alec, aka Mod Sween, if there was a poll in his heart of hearts he felt would have made the game better if it had passed. And here's what he said. To be honest, I, I can't think of one thing that would have been truly great for the game had it passed in the polls. I, I do believe that our players recognize what a great change entails and then votes accordingly. Stuff that has failed in a poll before, a lot of it ended up being reworked and reshaped based on player feedback anyway. And the stuff that wasn't just probably wasn't right for the game anyway. So there's, there's, not, there's nothing that... I look at and think, you know, damn, if only that passed, if only we did that, or if only players voted for that, where would the game would be now? So there's, there's nothing like that. To an extent, on the smaller scale, uh, the Divine Spirit Shield was a reward that we proposed for a boss fight, but at the time, I think it was too powerful for the game. Players voted no. I think I voted no even. That said, now, after a lot of years of careful managing of uh, power levels and power creep, it would probably fit quite nicely, but not at the time we offered it. And then looking at the three new skills we polled and they all failed, I don't look at any of them and think, you know, damn, they would have made the game great or greater. But that said, I'm really hopeful for the new skill we're working on now. Uh, in December, we had a green light poll for a new skill. Players came out and there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands even, and voted yes. So we're, we're in the process of that right now i think this is going to be a good opportunity and at this moment i'm really hopeful that players recognize the great opportunity there and kind of come on board and help design it with us but yeah to your question I can't really think of anything. I didn't quite get the answer out of him that I was hoping for with this question. I felt like he really played it a little safe with this answer. There's no way a passionate developer had one idea that they were super excited about that didn't make it through a poll, right? But I can also see why he wouldn't quite want to tell an entire community they were wrong about a poll. If there was a poll you think should have passed for the betterment of the game, let me know down in the comments. I'm really curious about this one. The polling system fascinates me. So I asked him about the fact that they use the polling system to not only add a new raid, but to design it piece by piece by pulling the community on every aspect of the raid. This is what he had to say about that experience. Yeah, you're spot on. That is how we pulled it. So we, we pulled the raid and then we spent some time working on and polling the rewards. Uh, it's quite a new approach, a new way of doing things with designing content this way. So historically, we've polled like a huge array of rewards to accompany raids and accompany boss fights all at the same time. But what this new staggered approach did is let us get the, the seal of approval to start working on a raid, which is a huge effort, and then spend time to properly work with the community on what rewards they'd like to see. Uh, after all, I think it's 
safe to say that players, you know, unanimously want a new raid because raids are cool. That's a given. But rewards are a bit more of a delicate matter. Uh, introducing new weapons and introducing new armors, it affects every other encounter in game. It affects training methods. It uh, affects prices of other equipment. It disrupts the economy to an extent and, and so on. Now, in terms of what surprise is, um, initially we were really careful with power creep. I mentioned power creep earlier, but we were really careful with power creep because players told us that it's important to be paying, be careful. And we're players too, and we don't want to, you know, massively change the game overnight. Not massively, um, but it it really quickly became quite apparent that with something like a raid, there was an expectation of having powerful flagship weapons and armors coming into the game. So I'd say that was a half surprise in itself, seeing the, the way the community reacted uh, and wanted, you know, really powerful stuff. So this this design process of rewards kind of occurred in three stages. Uh, initially, we had our design pitch, then we had a bit of a revamp, and then we had the final proposal, which was pretty much an overhaul of the stuff we'd offered. Now, our first proposal, we were trying to offer really interesting and unique progression in terms of uh, you know weapon progression and, and power scaling and stuff. It wasn't quite horizontal, but we weren't going the you know hit bigger numbers level of rewards. Now, these, this proposal wasn't disliked by any means, but we quickly recognized that it fell quite short of what players were expecting. I mentioned, right, looking for flagship stuff to accompany raids. So then we gradually and ultimately did go with the hit big numbers rewards and players really, really liked it. Um, all the proposals came with uh, DPS graphs and stuff like that to help players make the most informed decision around voting. And this isn't even including the appearance of the stuff, you know, how it looked. Our artists routinely show their design progress. So if I point to the Missouri armor set, which is like the new best in slot ranged armor set, it looks really quite different from when we first pitched it to players. Again, quite a surprise because the original pitch, the original design proposal, it looked really unique. Uh, a lot of subtle but really distinct stylings from anything else that existed in game. And then it, it turns out players wanted something else. They wanted something that looked a bit more traditional, looked a bit more powerful, looked a bit more MMO type armor, you know, spikier, that kind of thing. As he describes the process of building the raid, you can really see how the final product ends up being in line with the community's expectations. The community even went as far as policing earlier proposed additions that would have caused too much power creep. It's actually really interesting to see that the players would deny themselves overpowered weapons for the betterment of the game. I mean, that's what you'd hope they'd do in theory, but it's cool to see that it worked out that way in practice as well. In the end, the community wanted desirable upgrades, but they didn't want to break the game. After hearing about Old School RuneScape's community's restraint, when it comes to the polls, I'm all the more impressed by them. I'm not sure I could rely on other MMO communities to reliably vote to do what is best for the game instead of voting what's best for themselves. In a lot of MMOs, we see a vocal minority have an oversized impact on what changes are made to the game. Their voices are louder than perhaps a sometimes silent majority. And this polling system actually seems like the perfect way to counter that problem. So I asked Alec if he had a great example of the vocal minority asking for something that didn't end up passing the poll, despite the fact that they thought everyone else wanted it. So we try our best to listen to the entire player base, uh, which can be quite a challenge at times. Uh, we found that some players Despite our best efforts of throwing polls and surveys and stuff at them and live streams and being active on Discord and Reddit and Twitter, some players don't really want to engage. They're happy just playing the game. So I guess you'd say that's our silent majority. Now, we're trying to encourage like a wider base of discussion because I think that's best to help shape new content. Uh, we had some success recently. I mentioned the new skill poll back in December. That had nearly 200,000 unique voters participating in that poll, either voting for or voting against, which is just unreal. Uh, but to your point about, you know, looking at data, and identifying what content smaller groups of players might want at the expense of others. I think I've got a pretty good example uh, just from just a few weeks ago. So PVPers are uh, a minority of our player base. We know that most players don't PVP or don't want to PVP, but I feel that PVPers have a really long and storied history of RuneScape, and I'd hate to not see them listen to, but that can't also be the expense of our wider player base, which I think is what you're getting at, that kind of thing. So a few weeks ago, we reworked some PVE encounters in uh, the wilderness which is our pvp zone and those reworked encounters and environments and boss mechanics and rewards as well like new weapons that has been really successful uh, players of all types pvpers people trying to kill the bosses people in between trying to kill bosses and fight back against pvpers collection hunters they're all really enjoying it 
So I think there is an example where you can make a vocal minority happy in a way that benefits the entire game, but it takes a lot of compromise and it takes a little bit more design time. So as long as you're okay with that upfront, then there's no reason to shy away from that. He brought up some really interesting points in his example about how the PVPers would be a natural vocal minority. I see this in almost every MMO that has both PVP and PVP in it. All too often, the developers end up neglecting one side or the other, and more often than not, it's the PVPers that are getting the short end of the stick. This is where the polling system could very easily be a double-edged sword. The developers might want to help the PVPers, but with the PVPers being so outnumbered, it might be very difficult to get a poll to pass that would allow that. In the end, he says that compromise is key key and that they were able to work something out that everyone was happy with. So let me know down in the comments below RuneScape PVPers, how's the bowling system working out for you being that you're the minority? I'm curious to see your answers. Another thing old school RuneScape is pretty unique for is I think that it's the most popular MMO I know that facilitates what I will refer to as second screen content or content that you can sort of let autoplay itself. In RuneScape, as long as you interact with the game every so often, you won't get kicked and there are some tasks that your character will automatically perform. For instance, if you stand AFK in an area and something spawns and attacks you, your character will automatically fight back with whatever weapon you have equipped. Doing so will level up that weapon and any other relevant stats. This AFK skilling lets you progress in the game while working at work, or in my case, while editing a YouTube video. And it's something a lot of old school RuneScape players love about the game. So I asked Alec if the second screen content was something that they made intentionally, and here's what he had to say about that. So I think there's a little bit of irony in that I'm chatting to you right now and I'm in game in a moment doing some uh, AFK fly fishing, trading my fishing level. But look, we don't design content to be second screen. But what we do is recognize that there's a nice balance to be had between game content that requires not much click intensity and in turn gives you, you know, lower XP rates and things and content that requires a lot of click intensity and in turn gives you higher XP rates. So most skills in game have methods with low XP, low click and high XP, high click with a lot in between as well. Now, for every player like me who's AFK fishing outside of the city of Priftinas right now, there's somebody else immensely talented playing really intensely like a beast and then getting you know outrageous XP rates. So I think it's all about balance. It's an interesting type of content for sure. It kind of gives you the ability to be productive in life while also getting a little taste of that endorphin rush that you get when you know your character is progressing. It's just a tiny bit easier to get your chores, your homework, or your work done when you know your character is still progressing in spite of that. Like Alex said, you do progress much slower while AFK skilling than you do while actively playing the game. I do wonder what the size of the impact of AFK players is. It's not botting. They still have to be around and interacting with the game from time to time to keep things going but as long as they are interacting with the game every so many minutes they still count as a player would you be logged into your mmo more if you could progress at a fraction of the normal speed for being semi afk in the game would this demotivate you from actually playing it knowing that you could be progressing while afk it's an interesting topic that gives me more questions than answers for now but this brings us to our next topic which is a very popular one when talking about old school runescape i was very straight with alec and i said look every time someone talks about the success of old Old school RuneScape, myself included, the comment sections always filled up with people claiming that the entirety of the RuneScape population is nothing more than bots. In my opinion, there's a lot of reasons that this can't be true, but I asked him to give me his best defense of the validity of the RuneScape population to combat or to correct this common opinion. To my surprise, Alec actually answered this question head on and gave us information that they've never shared with anyone before. So listen up. Yeah, so bots and old school. Um, I think. I'm gonna have to be marketing man for a second. Firstly, I think we're just like any other MMO in that we're a target for cheaters. Now I'm not trying to um, what shirk responsibility or trying to deflect or anything, but when games like MMOs have opportunities to make money from player economies or they've got really hefty achievements in like we do to flex, then there's motive for cheaters. I think every MMO has issues. Uh, I think every MMO sees them vary in intensity with bots and cheaters, uh, whether you know they're targeting gathering nodes or they're gold farming or gold selling, or they're cheating in other ways like multi-boxing or using add-ons and cheat plugins and that type of thing too. Every MMO faces that to an extent. And no disrespect to other games, all, all I'm doing right now is just saying that they face the same challenges we do. And ultimately it's all just an arms race. It's about us trying to tackle something, cheaters adapting, we're adapting, they're adapting they've got incentive or motive to carry on doing what they're doing and we just have to carry on trying to stop them as best we can but okay I'll, I'll talk about the issues that old school faces 
in particular. So if I take the past weekend, like the weekend just gone, as I'm talking to you right now, we had about 135,000 concurrent players logged in at one time. That's with no major release. That's just a random weekend. But I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, concurrent also meaning, you know, logged in at one time and not total during the day, which is a much higher number of players. So in terms of getting an accurate look at bot numbers as percentage of our players. It really depends on how we get that number. We could use number of accounts reported by other real players to be botting, or we could look at band metrics. Now looking at either of these two methods, uh, it's a single digit percentage of players who are bots. Now the range varies, that's why I'm going to say single digit, um, some low, some higher in that range, but yeah, single digit percentage of players who probably are botting. So of that 135,000 players I mentioned earlier, the vast majority, almost all of them are real people and and real players but that's not me saying you know oh we're perfect it's not a problem um that's not true right we, we try not to let them get away with it we do care about it quite a lot our anti-cheating team in addition to the percentages i just said they also gave me some cool stats from 2022 during last year we banned four million accounts for botting and we removed uh, 15 trillion gp which is our game currency from Real world traders, uh, real world trading being the terminology we use for RMT, which I've like other MMOs tend to use. But if there's anything I do want to leave this answer with, it's more to just put my hands up and say, well, look, we're not perfect, but we are really getting better at it. In the, in the past week, literally the past week, uh, our data team working with our anti-cheating team have made really good progress on improving methods of automated detection. That's detection not punishment um it's probably too soon for me to share details but i'm really hopeful that we can talk to our players about this really soon it looks super promising and uh, we're also clamping down on people buying gold and buying items which is us it's about us trying to stem demand and then in turn hopefully removing the incentive behind people doing the cheating in the first place. But looking longer term into the future, I think the answer lies in just implementing better tech solutions, continuing to improve on the authentication measures we're, we're putting out at login. And this is a bigger one, right? But maybe we need to start having conversations with our players about integrating anti-cheating software. Uh, now that's a more controversial discussion to have. It is good, it works, but some players dislike how invasive it can be, but is it worth it for the greater good of the game i'm not sure i think it's worth a chat we should have with our player base as well you know i'm just talking about what we can do longer term and what that would require from our active players as well I 100% agree with him that bots exist in every MMORPG. Hearing the sheer number of bots they've banned is astounding though. At an estimated 4 million bots banned last year alone, that means they're banning 10,000 bots every single day. That is insane. A developer that is banning 10,000 bots a day is definitely not sitting idly by and letting bots run rampant. That sounds more like a developer that is fighting them on a daily and weekly basis. It sounds like Jagex is also considering ramping up anti-bot measures in their war against bots and looking for ways to make it harder for a bot to create an account. That's always the hardest part of free to play games. When there is no barrier to entry, when there is no cost to create an account, there is nothing stopping botters from creating thousands of accounts every day because nothing is lost when they are caught. If the game had cost as little as $5, that would be costing botters $50,000 a day. You can see how even a small box price goes a long way to curb large scale bot operations. Final Fantasy 14 allows players to play the game for free up until level 60 and handles this problem by severely limiting the amount a completely free to play player can interact with the community. They can't initiate whispers. They can't shout. They can't send friend requests. They can't make any significant amount of gold per day until they have spent some amount of money in the game. This prevents them from spamming chat with gold selling messages or doing all the things that we know RMTers to do in MMOs these days. This method of combating bots has worked really well in Final Fantasy 14 and I kind of wonder how it would work in old school RuneScape. But I digress. I think the most interesting thing Alex said was that the metrics all suggest the percentage of the community that is botting is in the single digits. That is very respectable for a free-to-play game. And if we look at Google Trends, we see there is a massive amount of real people seeking out old-school RuneScape content. The bots in the game are not Googling guides for the tutorials and watching YouTube videos. So despite what some players want to believe, old-school RuneScape is still massively popular and by my guess, is still at least the third most popular MMORPG in the world right now. And remember, it's been growing since 2013 and just might continue to do so. How popular will this MMORPG get? Will we see it make it all the way to the top spot? I'll definitely let you know if we do. Next, I asked Alec if he had any final thoughts and here's what he had to say. There's a lot of emphasis on kind of building a sandbox for players and creators to 
you know, it's playing, right? Uh, I will gladly die on this hill, but I think the content creation scene around old school is the best of any game. The variety, the storytelling, the skill mastery, the ways that our content creators interact with one another, genuinely believe it's second to none. Now, I'm gonna be quite cheeky. If I can recommend some content to your viewers, obviously after they watch this video, don't leave the video right now. Uh, I would say to go and check out Soup, his Gil and All game series. It's long form content that pitches a lot of different creators against each other, uh, like a reality TV. Swampletics for a like, mind boggling grind of immense discipline, emotional highs and lows, real roller coaster stuff. RS Chronicles for a good idea of what's going on with the game now. And uh, EVScape, his Battle Royale, if you're keen to see some great PvP content. Now, all of these have amazing production quality as well. Uh, and there are so, so many more. If I didn't mention you, I'm really focusing on YouTube here. Check out the Twitch directory as well. But if I didn't mention you, I'm so sorry. There are so many talented creators to get through, but I think that's a really good starting point for anybody curious about the old school content creation scene. Now, I've really enjoyed chatting to you. Uh, and again, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to your viewers about old school RuneScape. If there's one thing I can say before I leave is that give Old School RuneScape a chance. Look beyond the visuals if you know visuals are your thing. I think at its heart you'll find like a, a great game with a great community with a really pure sense of gameplay and uh, monetization. So try it out. Old School RuneScape's turning 10 uh, later this month, That's which is huge. And it's even though we're turning 10, I think we're just getting started. We're really starting to hit our stride. We've got a really, really talented team. We've got new leadership in place and it's all about empowering players at the moment. Um, so I hope you come on a journey with us. I joined Jagex in 2015, like I said earlier, and I'm probably the most excited and the most positive felt that I've ever felt about the game right now. So yeah, look, thank you. Thanks for your time. Give old school RuneScape a chance. To that I say thank you, Alec, and thank you, Mod Goblin, for bending over backwards to help me make sure I met my deadline on this video. These guys were not just developers, but also very clearly gamers, and you could feel that in the way they spoke about the game. If you enjoyed this video and hate microtransactions, be sure to like and subscribe for the algorithm gods and for more MMO content. I want to also give a special shout out to my YouTube members who kick in five bucks a month to help this channel give the highest quality content I can. If you want to become a YouTube member for access to an exclusive Discord channel, behind the scenes footage, and more click the join button below in this video. If you ever want to talk about MMORPGs while I'm live, come visit me over at twitch.tv slash lucky ghost. Sincerely, thank you for watching. And if you're not sure what to do next, check out one of the videos popping up on screen right now.